My name is Helen Fothergill. I'm the um, service manager for um, Aberdeen Archives, Gallery and Museums. And um, I would like to um, welcome everybody um, who is here to present um, this evening. And that's um, Joe Gilbert, uh, Noon Salah Adin, and Helen Love, and I'll introduce them a little bit um, as we go forward. But what I wanted to just let everybody know was the reason um, that we're here, if you don't already know. Um, we were extremely um, pleased to receive Museum of the Year Award from um, the Art Fund in 2020 for the new art gallery. Um, it's been a bit of a peculiar period with um, various COVID lockdowns. So if you haven't already been to see us, please do come and visit us. Um, but instead of um, using what is prize money to um, run a, a, a project or, um, you know, spend it on champagne um, or, or fund a new toilet because we, we were we were in, um, you know, in a wonderful position not to need that. We felt that actually what we really wanted to do was to share our good fortune with people who had been supportive of us throughout the entire redevelopment um, and also mercenarily um, add to our collection with um, local um, practicing artists. Um, so those in the Aberdeen postcode area um, and really um, get to know people a little bit better. We had been closed for many years. Um, we'd been behind the scenes beavering away at, at trying to get new displays ready and, and building um, the, the new art gallery from the inside and out. And so really it was a time for us to put our heads back above the parapets and um, go out and meet and greet our creative colleagues in the city. Um, so at the beginning of um, 20, well, at the end of 2020, we launched um, what we call the Micro Commissions Programme, which was two rounds of funding um, directed at um, creative practitioners in the AB postcode. Um, there were two levels of funding. One was at um, £3,000 for the award and the other one was at about, uh, about £800 um, for another award. And really it was designed to encourage um, people of, of from lots of different practices and lots of different levels of confidence to apply for the funding. Um, we were massively oversubscribed, uh, which was wonderful to see. Um, and some of the um, people who submitted we'd like to go back and revisit and work with in the future. Um, but really um, the the, the ones that were selected and um, Helen Noon and Joe are here tonight with some of those um, and there's another event um, with some of the um, other successful um, micro commission awardees. Um, really, we chose the, the, the ones that excited us the most. Um, and we hope that they excite you too. And if you haven't already been into the gallery, um, there is a display on that shows all of their works. So I'm going to move on fairly swiftly and introduce our first artist um, tonight who's going to speak to us about some of her experiences undertaking the micro commissions um, and that is Jo Gilbert. Jo, are you happy to take up the mantle? Uh, yes, I am. Thank you. Brilliant. Oh, that's better. The Abdi doesn't hate to look at my coupon. <laughs> um, so thank you, um, <clears throat> Helen. I am Jo Gilbert and I'm a writer and spoken word artist from Aberdeen. Um, and I did three poems in total for my micro commission. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've got a frog in my throat, of course, just as I start talking. Um, and you know, when I saw the the application for the the micro commissions, I got really excited. Um, purely because the art gallery has been such a huge part of my life, um, you know, and the fact that they were looking for kind of 
um, voices from all kinds of backgrounds and, you know, wanted to kind of um, hear people that maybe weren't heard before, um, you know, and for me coming from a working class background, um, generally <laughs> it's seen as art and poetry and all these wonderful things are kind of closed to a lot of people, especially probably not so much now because there is more kind of opportunities, but I mean, I can just imagine if I'd ever told my feather that I liked poetry, he would have, you know, I kind of swear, <laughs> but he would have made fun of me for it. You know, um, <clears throat> you just didn't do things like that, um, the kind of sort of background I came from. And uh, you were seen as being arty farty or posh or whatever. Um, and so I'm very glad that I got rid of those ideas <laughs> and beliefs. Um, and the art gallery has been somewhere, you know, that I've kind of gone with my friends, you know, I would go in there for coffee, just go in and have a little wander around for a bit of peace. And I thought it's really important to keep those kind of places open and free for everybody. Um, and then one of my best pals had a kid, um, which was like a nuclear bomb landing in all of our lives. <laughs> And so I was kind of charged a couple of times a week to take him out for the afternoon when she was working. And and the art gallery was like amazing because it just kept him so amused. He loved all the stuff, you know. And so that was the kind of inspiration behind um, my original idea for my application was this kind of journey. Um, and, you know, my, my nephew is not my real nephew, but he is. <laughs> um, and he was going on a date we weren't allowed to call it a date at the time but he was going on a date with a girl and he decided to take her to the art gallery and I got all moony and like oh my god because to me it was like he was showing her pieces of himself reflected in the art and I just thought that was so lovely um and just showed how much of an impact all of those kind of afternoons we'd spent um, you know, wandering around, usually with me panicking, trying not to get him to touch things. <laughs> um, but he was just so into it, you know, and he still got his kind of favourites. Um, <clears throat> so those were really big influences in a lot of the things that I wanted to write about. Um, and I was very lucky uh, to do a wee recce <laughs> around the art gallery just before we went into lockdown. So I had pictures and I had notes and, you know, I kind of used that um, in, in the process of my writing um, after I was told that my um, application had been successful. And so the first poem that I wrote is a kind of a little homage um, to my nephew and also to the kind of background that I'm from as well. Um, and so it's a poem there that you can see, which is called Velveteen Beings, which is kind of like um, the, the Velveteen Rabbit uh, inspired kind of title. And it's uh, this piece of artwork, which I found hugely fascinating by Gavin Turk called Habitat. And you think it just looks like an old monkey sleeping bag, like you can't really see the detail and, and the realness of it. Um, in that picture, but I was just fascinated with it. Um, and it's a sculpture, you know, it's painted bronze, um, but it's made to look like an old sleeping bag. Um, and so I'd kind of had this uh, experience with my nephew where <laughs> he was trying to touch it to see if it was real. And I'm like, oh. but it was like this wee moment of, you know, looking back into my past, and here's me with being, you know, trusted with somebody's actual child, um, you know, and it was like standing in a mirror looking into my old life. Um, and so I really wanted to write about that experience and and how that, you know, anybody anywhere can turn their lives around, um, no matter what your background is. Um, and so I just kind of really wanted to write about that experience and also like my love for my nephew and, and the gratitude and, and stuff um, for the relationship that we've got. Um, you know, uh, he was never an annoying kid, which was good because <laughs> I'm not really, I don't like kids. Well, I do, but just from a distance. Um, but he was just so chilled and like I'm sure he's had a past life before. He was just so laid back. And a lot of the time he's guiding me and teaching me, you know, um, and he's older now, obviously, and, and we're going to gigs and stuff together and, and uh, all of that. But yeah, I just kind of wanted to celebrate that 
relationship in my life and all the kind of um, meaning and connotation that I found in that particular artwork. Um, can I have the next slide, please? <laughs> so this is my other favourite, uh, Yon Harry Stick. Uh, but before I delve into that, I'll do a little bit about um, the other poem that I don't have a picture of, which is a kind of more performancey one. And so when I was thinking about, you know, writing and my kind of process is that I've got a wee notebook that I use and that's from my little sketches and doodles and notes and I kind of leave an idea to brew for a little while. And so if I get like a sentence or a line or a word or I see something, a quote, I'll sit and I'll scribble it down. <clears throat> and then from that little notebook, all the wee notes and lines then get transferred into a big <laughs> notebook. <laughs> I've got a very particular process at the moment that might change. Um, and then, you know, I kind of start drafting, making a draft. And then once I've kind of got the bones of the poem, then I would commit it to a computer. I'm very old fashioned, but I do love a notebook. Um, I just feel like, I don't know why, but I just like that process of actually physically writing stuff in a notebook. Um, and I'm a fan of a fountain pen. And so I wanted, you know, as though I was writing about quite personal things in the other two poems, I wanted to kind of capture that essence of what the art gallery is for people like me. Um, you know, so it's a first date venue, it's, you know, a music venue, I've gone to lunchtime concerts there, there's been, you know, DJs and workshops and, you know, it's, it's and most importantly, it's our space, <laughs> you know, it belongs to us as people of the city um, and a, a lot of people didn't realise that, um, they didn't realise that it's theirs, you know, and especially those kind of societal barriers, um, sometimes they can be quite intimidating um, for people to go into, especially if you're anywhere in the right class or you feel you're, you didn't look the part or whatever. And I just wanted to kind of, you know, create this piece that's it's for everybody. It doesn't matter if you're a mom or you're near a mom or, you know, you've got kids, you've not got kids, you know, whatever. It doesn't matter. Um, it's it's your place and, and, you know, it belongs to you. So swiftly moving on to my last poem, um, which is Yon Hairy Stick. This is my absolute all time favourite piece of art. Um, and it was my nephew that noticed it first and he would demand to see it every time we go on. Where's the Hairy Stick? Where's the Hairy Stick? And it used to be up kind of like in a corner on the wall, but he noticed it straight away. Um, and it's weird and wonderful and beautiful and ugly. And I just felt like it encompassed all the things that um, that I wanted to write about, um, you know, and that sometimes being other or being far away from normal isn't a bad thing, you know, to me, it's a great thing and it should be celebrated and it's our differences that um, make us exciting and interesting and, and all of that stuff. Um, and it's, <clears throat> excuse me, also in Doric. Um, which I love. It's it's the wire spick. Um, and I didn't take a photo of it to rile up my dad, but I wish I had. Because <laughs> he would have been like, what the hell is that? He would have been horrified um, that, you know, uh, he wouldn't have accepted it as, as a, a thing. Um, and I think that kind of encapsulates a lot of sometimes Northeast sort of ideals. Um, but hopefully some of that's changing and hopefully... Um, I can maybe change some of that with the with the poems as well. So I will wish the new <laughs> and hand it back to you, Helen. I Thank you, Joe. Some sense to somebody. That, no, that's that was brilliant. Thank you so much. And I think we'll come back with questions um, at the end of all of this as well, if you if you're happy with that. Um, so I'm going to hand over um, to Helen and Noon now. It's a little bit of a a double act. Um, Helen's going to speak first and then hand over to Noon. So I'll I'll let you um, run with that if that's okay, Helen. Um, right. So this is the Powers Gate, and that, uh, so I'll just start at the beginning of the story. <laughs> this is what it was all about. Um, I grew up uh, for the first three years of my life near this gate, and I walked past it as a toddler, and was really scared of it. I thought there was something horrible living in those towers and I was scared to walk past. So um, 
later in my life, like recently, last 10 years, I've lived near it again. And so in the lockdown, we were out walking um, and walking through that gate and noticed for the first time, because everything was sort of slower pace, <laughs> that there's carvings above the archway. I don't think you can see them really in detail in that picture, but in the middle of that archway on that little peak bit, there's a sort of coat of arms and there's three heads that look a bit like enslaved people with head scarves and earrings and features and so on. And uh, I was looking at it thinking, does that mean that this um, gate is built with slavery money? You know, it, it, there was all the stuff with them. Um, uh, Black Lives Matter kicking off in the States and it was in the forefront of my head um, all the issues and it just just popped into my head so I did some research and it was a little bit more complicated so although they were not actually meant to be represent enslaved people they were meant to be moors it was sort of a heraldic pun but um the, the it was indeed the the gate was indeed built with slavery money so compensation from um uh abolition of slavery when slaves were freed and their owners were compensated but of course the slaves weren't compensated the enslaved people weren't compensated so um i wanted to mark it in some way i thought we need to mark this place so people know you know and that was around the time i met noon who's my uh, co-worker, my collaborator. And um, we met at a demonstration because we're both into activism and art and activism. And um, it was for the, against the deportation of a, an autistic teenager, um, Osime Brown. And um, Noon uh, was willing to take part in this project and offered to write her poem. Um, so the aim was I was going to make a ceramic piece to hang on the gate and she was going to perform a poetry piece in the gate and make a sort of event, a sort of guerrilla event, you know, just <laughs> without asking anyone. But then the, the micro commissions came along and we thought it fitted really well. Um, and went for it. So then, of course, we had to ask for loads of permissions and um, and permission to film from the university and so on. And it was COVID. Um, but with doing that, we got in touch with some of the academics at the university and they very kindly gave us their access to their research on the history of the gate. And we had we were able to read the original registries of all the enslaved people um, of the Powys Leslie family in Port Castile, Fort Penn in Jamaica. Um, and one of the names on the registry was Kwashiba. So she's an actual person. Um, and she had at least four, maybe seven children that were also on the registry, um, as far as I can tell. But I tried to do an illustration of her. I think we should move on, actually. <laughs> I forgot to move on to the next picture. Yeah, so this was the event, but I think Noon will tell you a bit more about that later. But what was really nice was that we had all the people um, that were in the micro commissions group, all the other artists to come and watch. And it was pretty much the only time that we actually got together as a group, which was lovely. Uh, these are my um, ceramic pieces that were on the gate and it's a paper clay technique and embossed. So this is Noon's poem on the left. Uh, the violence of identity and this is my imagined portrait of Kwashiba on the right and one was on each side of the gate tied on um, and I also made for the event some little mementos which I'll hold up and some were smaller than this but this was an idea from Wedgwood who were um, in the 17th, in the 18th century, they were abolitionists, the ceramics company Wedgwood, and they made these mementos that said, um, am I not a man and a brother? 
So you'll probably have seen it. So a little of a black enslaved person on his knees in chains. And I didn't like that. I just wanted to make something a bit more proud. And um, it was Kushiba's face looking out at you. And um, it's got a line from Noon's poem on it as well. Uh, what do you see when you look at me? And these were just to give out to everybody that came to the event. And that's what we did. And everybody that helped us. Um, so that was part of it as well. My um, modern version of Wedgwood's little abolition mementos that they gave out at abolition meetings um, hundreds of years ago. So, so I uh, worked with Noon and we got on really well. And we have since been working as a duo and we're working on new projects together. So that came out of it as well. But I'd like Noon to tell you the rest of the story. Hello. Hi. Uh, Hi, Noon. We can hear you. <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you very much for having us here today and um, hearing from Joe and, and Helen as well. Um, so to talk about my, or just a collaboration with Helen, really, I think it started as a collaboration and now we became like evolved into friendship now. Best of friends, <laughs> I would say. And uh, just bonding through, you know, using um, art as a form of activism and just changing. Um, yeah, I always believe that art should be somehow, it's not like um, making people feel uncomfortable, but generally making them feel, making them to think. Uh, so my poem, The Violence of Identity, which um, I performed as part of the project, um, it just draws generally reflecting on my uh, journey as an immigrant from Sudan coming to the UK and just using poetry as a way of um, making sense of you know where I am at the moment and where I'm standing and generally um, this new culture that I'm trying to be part of. Um, and the name came from um, write essays by the Indian um, economist and philosopher uh, Dr. Amartya Sen and uh, it was titled Identity and Violence, the Illusion of Destiny. Um, so in it, in the poem I explore how social relations and self-identity are generally threatened by often crude and um, unidimensional definitions of identity. So you see somebody and you say okay because they're wearing scarf and because of what media is projecting I know this and this and that about them or you try to box them in certain certain box um or because of the color of the skin or or anything you know um that you feel you have the um the reason to box them in certain box um, so generally talking about my experience as somebody who came to the UK and worked in the medical field because um, I came to train uh, in pediatrics as a profession and um, the thing that you hear when you have to prove you have to work three times uh, more than the other people for you to feel like you are at the same level I've been through all that so not that I've developed a thick skin but anyway um, art is um, where I feel that I can actually make sense of these things. Um, and I generally believe that um, social and personal peace come from acknowledging the singular, complex, contrary and conflicted human behind the mass of identity, whether um, as a woman or as, uh, you know, generally what are the things that you're gonna label me um, Worse, to be honest, because somebody has asked me once if I'm a feminist and I said, uh, this was actually, a, it's not like a joke, a comedian has mentioned for us, she said, by the time she climbed the mountain of being a Muslim and then a, and then being a, a woman and then a feminist. So there is a lot of things that you feel you can box people into, but um, I think we just maybe we need to chill out a little bit and um, you know, just go back into simple being being human. Anyway, I'm just laughing, chatting, I don't know. Yeah. So yeah, it has been great working with Helen and um, the violence of identity is a very um, important piece to me because 
it's talks about me being in the UK, but also talking about issues back home as well, since FGM and violence against women. So it's all incorporated into it. Thank you, Neil. That's wonderful. I, I didn't know whether you wanted to say anything about the um, the costume design. Um, uh, I was going to, but I think Yusra should be one of the uh, audiences as well. So generally, my Excellent. dress was made by, yeah, by a modesty fashion designer, Yusra Sadik, and she is Sudanese Welsh. So and the dress, she named it Kandaka, which uh, is the ruling queens of the North Kingdom of Sudan of Kush. So I felt it was just, I always feel like this when I go out and open mics, like what you're wearing is just sometimes um, give you a bit of boost. So she's from Sudan coming to the UK as well. So I felt, um, yeah, and it was make, she, um, it's all environmentally friendly, I would say. So it was made from recycled materials. And if I'm not mistaken, I think the sheet, it's actually bed sheets that the, she made the dress from, uh, found in a traditional Sukh in Sudan. So I will let her speak about it. But yeah, it was amazing just to feel empowered by wearing something from a sister as well. Thank you so much. That's wonderful. And we're going to open the floor to um, questions as well. Um, and I, I don't know whether I, I need to open the chat um, just in case. Um, but one of the questions that I would like to ask is um, first directed to Joe, but more open um, to, to everybody is, is how can, and it's very selfish really, but how can the gallery and what we do be more open to you as creative practitioners and more open to the public? How can we best welcome people in? Are there simple tricks or are we are we um, way off the mark? Oh, that's a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think that this this um, project has been a gateway into um, starting that conversation with local artists and um, it certainly kind of raised my awareness of the gallery as a creative practitioner, um, <clears throat> you know, kind of not as a person. And I suppose it's kind of highlighted it to other people like my mom, who's never actually been in <laughs> and probably will never come in. But she knows it's there, you know, and she's seen pictures of it and, um, you know, people that I'm friends with and stuff. Um, I don't know. I think I don't know if it's. You know, because I'm already an artist making work, mm -hmm. that I've kind of had that in. Whereas maybe people that aren't as kind of established as me, there's still maybe a little bit of work to do. I think. Um, I think coming I over that threshold seems to be a big, a big blockage, doesn't it? It's that that enormous facade of a building. Yeah. Um, you know, so I'd be, uh, you know, if anybody else has any wild ideas, I'd really welcome them <laughs> like what i would really like to see as a person like just as a kind of ordinary person is people like welcoming you like it in kind of a way when i went in when it um they had covid you know there was the wee table and there was mass and but somebody was talking to you on your way in you weren't it i think whereas before and certainly before you had the refurbishment it was a bit mausoleum like <laughs> you know but I want to go and see art you know I'd kind of pushed past those societal barriers that are kind of put on me because my class but other people may not have been and I think it's really daunting for some folk you know I mean like my other job you know when we ask people do you want to come and see art the first two things to say is I can't draw and I wasn't good at art at school and so there are all these kind of societal barriers and barriers in your head you know I don't know anything about art but you don't need to know anything about art to appreciate it or like it or go and investigate it but people think that they do so I think that kind of you know maybe having somebody at the door Hiya, how are you doing? Are you just in for a wee look around or, you know, make them feel like they're welcome and they, they belong there? Um, so, yeah, that's my tuppence worth. Thank you. And Noon, do you have any opinions on this or? It's very awkward putting you on the spot with questions like this, but. <laughs> no, no, because, uh, you know, like I'm, I'm, I was born and raised in, in, in Sudan as well. And as Joe, I, I will, yeah, consider myself working class family like 
if we don't work, we don't work, we, we don't afford food. So art is seen as my family, like we we draw and do all the things, but you know, going into art galleries and it's it's not a thing that's being affordable to everybody. And I think for me, I think art, because I, I come from a um being like as a pediatric doctor, art as a form of therapy as well and being introduced to to children at school um from um a bit off i would say um it's not like uh i shouldn't say poor background but but yes you know like because i think um i don't know how how will i kind of put that i think it should be affordable like introduced to schools as well like it's something that's you can do it and that as a form of therapy and as a form of uh, expressing yourself is not um as joe mentioned earlier that it's not a thing that um for certain people um since doing this i've been sharing it with my nieces here and you know other people in the um black community as well and sudanese community because i don't think that um for me to come from sudan just three years ago five years ago actually and to get my work um now thank you very much being in the in the art gallery it's, it's just it's amazing I, I will say that i'm proud of it i'm proud of the work that i've done with helen and to see my parents happy about it as well and my siblings so it's i think i would love to see other um people from underprivileged communities to be involved in it but i don't know how will you be able to do that i think it's important to give them a way to express themselves and to see themselves in these places as well Thanks. And Helen, do you have a view on this one? Yeah, I don't have a lot to say, but I did think that the whole micro commissions experience was really good. I think that I think you should do that again. <laughs> I think um, I was in a place where I my artistic career had gone a bit down the rails for a lot of personal reasons and stuff that gone on but um it gave me a kick start again and I, i'm prouder of this than of anything you know and um i think the whole way we, we were sort of mentored by um oh my <laughs> by Les leslie ann uh, leslie ann and and, and um Madeline. Oh, that's why I have to write all the things down. <laughs> Madeline, yeah. Yeah. Leslie and Madeline was sort of helpful to to guide us through what could have been a bit intimidating. But um yeah, and that kind of support. Uh, I th yeah. I think a lot of artists could benefit from this way in right. to, to become more professional, I think. Yeah. That's brilliant. And I think I think, you know, that was something that we were very keen to do to try and get you to value your own time as well. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the one of the things that we do want to do is going forward is try and find some funding to make sure that we continue with a, a micro commissions one because we've had a whale of a time mm -hmm. um, and it's been really a, I mean, it's been a steep learning curve for us as well. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not something we've ever done before. And I think that one of the things um, that, you know, I, I was very passionate about was the the awareness that what we what we're trying to do is support creatives who happen to live in Aberdeen mm -hmm. there's sometimes a bit of a stigma around the term local artist it implies that a local artist is less than a national artist but actually you know you are just artists mm -hmm. and creatives that happen to live near me <laughs> and I think that that's that's one of the things I want to be able to celebrate with the um, art gallery going forward is that this is an amazing wealth of creative talent within our reach, either on the wall in the gallery or out there in the real world. So mm -hmm. I'm you know, really hopeful that we, we're going to um, continue with that. I'm aware of the time and I've got one question here. Um, really is is how has the process 
change the way that you feel about either commissions or your own artwork and practice going forward? Has it changed it? Has it, you know, made no impact whatsoever? Or has so have, has there been a sea change? Who wants to go first? Shall we go in reverse order? Let's go to Helen first. Hi. Um, yes, there's been a change, I think, to confidence, massive confidence boost. Um, yeah, and I think also, I think it's a really nice idea to be part of a group as well, that feeling that we were all working on this together. We were very varied artists, but that was an, an obviously without the COVID, that a lot more could be made out of that making a little community of the group of commissioned artists. Um, and I think that was important too, yeah. Noon, you're up next. I would agree with Helen. I think it's the confidence and the support as well. And to feel, because until I've heard it, Sudanese Aberdonian artists is like, well, I actually belong to Aberdeen, yes. It's the first place that I came to the UK you know, the sea, everything about it. I love Aberdeen. Like, even if I go down to anywhere else, it's I still consider it as home. So the sort of, I think it's scooped it into something that's professional with the meetings with Madeline and Leslie Ann and um, Helen as well, um, and just generally talking about it. And I know when you say that local artists, but, you know, the thing about Aberdeen that... Um, the community is small, yes, but, you know, it's just very supportive of each other um, from, you know, the spoken word poetry scene to other artistic scene. I would not have been here if it wasn't for Joe, who actually encouraged me to go and perform poetry. So I think and here we are here today since that was 2018, we are 2022. So looking back to it, you know, like, yes, that encouragement and trying to, you know, find a space for you to to perform whether to come you know like it's it's an opportunity to get the micro commission and i think it um hopefully you will get more funding for you to continue to do that and support more local artists really and just it's a message art is a message and i hope um even if it's not national artists but we're doing something to um that's you know sending a message something about ourselves and about the artwork we're doing to change to change something as well. Thanks, Noon. And we've got uh, about five minutes left of the entire session. So, Joe, if I can have your answer in about one to two <laughs> minutes, that would be great. And then I'll wrap up. <laughs> so uh, I'll try and condense it. I think like to touch on what um, both Helen and uh, Noon have said about the kind of community thing you know we've all been kind of messaging each other and getting in touch and then we're all like Fran we're going to go in and see it and you know kind of um, messaging people and then that day we got to spend with Noon and, and Helen were filming that was just lovely you know there was that kind of because we hadn't actually met also I knew some people personally through other things it was just nice to get that physical connection and amongst the lockdown but I think for me in terms of my own practice it's really made me think a bit more outside the box um you know and, and looking at how other art forms can inspire um you know and kind of looking at, at different ways to I suppose expand my own practice and, and I'm always trying to push myself and try different things and so doing those responses to other pieces of art I find that really um rewarding and enjoyable um but I think most for me is the, the validation <laughs> I've got the worst inner saboteur um they are really horrible and um you know when I was telling my brother I'd got it and like he's not in the slightest bit interested in poetry whatsoever you know and I told him and he was like well what what fit does that mean in and I was like, well, I was like, if humans haven't all killed each other in the next 500 years, people will be able to look at the collection and my poems will be in there. And he went, mm. <laughs> which is high praise indeed. <laughs> so like that, like I'm nearly greeting thinking about it just now because I was just like, you know, that that's amazing. Um, 
you know, um, a wee chuffed our quine for hot in. <laughs> so, yeah, um, aye. That's so you'll set, you're going to set me off as well at this rate. Right, so I'll <laughs> shut up now instead of back it up to greet. <laughs> But thank you thank you so much for um coming along and talking to us tonight joe helen noon and um just to let everybody know that there is a, another um online event in for exactly the same format that madeline ward will be hosting in my stead and that is on wednesday the 23rd of february at 6 30 the same time as um this one tonight um and if you are watching this on catch up on um, uh, online, then um, you should be able to find the other um, recording posted nearby as well. Thank you all very much. And we will be kicked out of this um, uh, session very shortly. So we will say good night. Thank you all. <laughs>